Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to a, another episode of Supply Chain Information Flow. I am your host, David Johnson. Happy Hump Day. Uh, and on behalf of ISM New Jersey and its board, we'd like to welcome you to what should be an exciting 45 minutes of conversation with the classification guru, my own personal uh, data cleansing um, master, Miss Susan Walsh. Um, I, would, I would like to welcome you to the Supply Chain Information Flow. Thank you very Thank much you for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I think we, we've been speaking about this for a while and it felt like it was such a long time away in the future and now the future's here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going we're gonna to have uh, a fun time. We're going to talk about, you know, everything from resilience as you, a, an author, a, a speaker, a TED talker. Um, we're going to talk about data and we're going to talk about procurement. So it should be fun. Is there anything else that that we as a procurement organization and our fans, family and friends should know about you? Aside from oh. the snazzy pinup that you got behind you? Oh, uh, well, that's 3D Susan and Robbie Williams, my future husband, a uh, big singer here in the UK. Uh, I guess uh, if you don't know, I'm Scottish, but I live just outside London and have done for nearly 20 years. Um, some, I had a, an online team night in last week and we all had to say something about and us and had to guess whether it was a truth or a lie. And my story was that I used to have my tongue pierced. That is the truth. So I don't think many people know about that. So that's a bit of a bit of a new bit of information there for you. Um, and I did not start out in the data or the procurement world. I was in sales and merchandising and retail and national accounts and dealing with all that good stuff and shopper marketing as well. I did, I did a little bit of that. And when I realized that wasn't for me, I then opened a clothes shop for women in Guildford and that didn't work either. It was too expensive. And then I was really <laughs> broke. And I had to go bankrupt, but I couldn't afford to go bankrupt because I had no money. So I got a job online uh, working for a spend analytics company, classifying procurement spend data. And that's how it all started. That is an amazing story. We talk about, you know, resilience. That's an incredible story of not giving up. Like you had highs and you had lows and now you're back on top again as, you know, kind of a very well-known uh, like procurement advocate, spend, anal spend analysis, if I can get that word out once, right? I'll be happy today. Um, and we'll try you with taxonomy then, we'll not go there. <laughs> no, no I, no, I can get taxonomy, taxonomy I've got. <laughs> it's analysis, that's not working for me today. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about as procurement people, the value that we can bring. And part of that value is understanding, you know, exactly the interplay between what we do, uh, containing cost, and how we, our organizations have to spend money, the types of data that we ingest, the types of data that we're, we're constantly trying to massage and, and, and glean insights out of but we never really think about it holistically. We don't think about, oh, well, we've got this supplier who's in our spend system seven times with seven different names, right? Yeah. So let me ask you, as a person who's lived in this world, why is clean data so important to us in the procurement function? You just talked about delivering value and cost savings. You can't do any of that without clean data because you're not delivering genuine value or cost savings if the data's wrong. You're, you don't really know. You could be delivering two or three times as much as that. And, and on the flip side of that, you could be increasing profit. And that's what the decision makers love to hear. You know, Never mind talking about making savings. Everybody talks about making savings. Let's talk about driving profit. 
and, and let's get procurement more uh, visibility in the business and a bit more, a lot more respect, actually. They need a lot more respect, but um, it affects everything. If you're sitting down at a table with your supplier and they have a set of numbers and you have a set of numbers, how many times do they match? Very rarely, I'm guessing. That's what I hear a lot. And so does your supplier have the upper hand in the good negotiation because they have the right data and you don't? And are they getting more out of this than you because you don't have the right data? Um, are you wasting weeks or days, hours um, trying to figure out stuff in the data because it's wrong? I mean, how much time do you is wasted when it could be spent on strategic work and and more and more not more important things because absolutely data is the foundation of all of that it builds it's the foundation of the house of procurement where everything sits on top but it's always just kind of tagged on to someone else's job it's always someone else's responsibility someone else's problem and then it's never seen as a priority and so it never gets done just really quickly just out of curiosity and this is just me being nosy can you guys just in the chat, just a yes or no. Do you trust your data in your procurement system? Like, how much do you trust? Maybe a if percent. There's a, if there's a yes, there's someone's fibbing, Pinocchio. <laughs> I got one no. Uh-huh, yeah. I have a long no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't expect a yes. Yeah. No, no 100%. Neither. Uh-oh, Kim Castellucci said 60-40. Kim is it's very still not yes, though. <laughs> All right. So, Susan, as my personal spend guru, spend analytics, procurement analytics guru, what do you do if you don't trust your data? I think, first of all, we have to be really realistic about, about what we can achieve with the data we've got. No data set will ever be 100% accurate. What you should be striving for is as accurate as possible. Um, most Clients I work with, their top 80% of spend will be in pretty good shape because it's the highest value spend. People are, the business is looking at it, interrogating it. Where you want to start next is your tail spend, which can be huge. And within that, you might want to focus on specific regions or countries that are like higher priority and start working with that and then work your way down and maybe tackle it that way or cut it by a different measure, but try and put these tasks into small measurable chunks. That's, that's really helpful. And before you do all of that, please normalize your suppliers so that you actually know how much you are spending with that one supplier. And I was just posting the other day about, you know, be careful of words when it's got the in front of the, the supplier name, you know, you can catch a few extra ones with the this. So normalizing your, when you say normalizing the supplier names, that's really and truly just making sure that it's consistent across, you know, it's it's one supplier and there's not the or i.b.m, right? Yeah. I don't it's, know if you guys um, know, but uh, Susan is a, an author. Yeah. Uh, her book, Beneath the Spreadsheets, is <gasps> between the spreadsheets. Oh my goodness! I almost said. Oh yeah, we book. tried. I tried to make it as fun and flirty as possible. <laughs> um, it's a great book. I have a copy of it. I don't have a copy of it with me, uh, so I had to ask Susan to to make sure that she showed. Yeah, it. Uh, here's but some chapters if you, if you want to have a look. If you are. In, in a procurement function, um, I highly recommend that you grab a copy of that book. Um, if you want to be strategic in any way, shape, or form, uh, like if you're if you want to do market analysis, if you want to do category management, grab her book. It's so helpful. Some real um, quick wins in there as well, though. It doesn't have to be really complicated and technical and, oh, we need a million dashboards. Let's just classify some data and put it in a pivot table. You can work with that. It doesn't have to be complex. 
She's absolutely right. And she tells you how to do all of that in the book. It's been very helpful to me personally, which is why I was so excited what to talk to you. What was your favorite chapter? So my world has been a living nightmare of uh, supplier normalization. I have, oh. and I, I work currently for an organization that's grown by acquisition. So yeah, they're the worst. <laughs> and then we put everything together into one system and now it's, you know, Infosys yeah. Limited, Infosys Dot Limited. Oh, Infosys. yes. You know, SPZ or all. Yeah. It's so frustrating. And I have I have responsibility for reporting out on spend and those kind of things. Honestly, and then you're like, like, I would almost say to you that I would do that for free because it's so therapeutic cleaning all that stuff up. I love it. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. Um, and yeah, you know, m and activity makes supplier data very difficult to manage, right? Along with the parent-child supplier relationships, doing business as disregarded entities, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Laura, um, and for I think for the comment. Yeah, I was just reading those too, and and there's so much out there that you can find on the parent-child relationships. But as a procurement professional, sometimes you just want to know how many emphasis, how much you bought or sold with emphasis. Like you don't care about the the entities, um, and so that's that's where I'm trying to plug that gap. And um, you know, I am working on something this year the like an off-the-shelf product that hopefully you know people can use that will make their lives a bit easier because you know let us maintain that list and you just go in and download a new updated version however often you want you know imagine that that would be fantastic uh when you get that up and running give me a call okay i'm there i need a guinea pig so <laughs> i am more than willing to help no I problem guess. at all we have a, a question that came in from Mr. Dupree Jones, from Dupree Jones. Mr. Hello. Mr. I'm not sure. Hi, Dupree. Um, be it SIG, ISM, SIPs, or other related groups, of which ISM is definitely the best, by the way, um, what types of procurement, data analytics, data management certifications are emerging? Honestly, I have not seen anything. So that's the reason they started with the book. I am videoing some courses over the summer that will be available online by hopefully the end of the summer because there is such a massive um, gap in this area for training. And, and, and you know, I, I would like to work towards some kind of certification for my courses, but actually I think it's more important just to get them out there first and get people using them. And then, and then from that, you know, I might be able to get some certification or CPD hours or whatever it is. But, but for me, it's more important to be able to have that resource for people to be able to access. Yeah. And things yeah. like that, you know, you can sync that through the HR training budget as well. So, you know, <laughs> put it in someone else's GL code. <laughs> That's a great point. We can get somebody else to pay for it. That's true. And uh, Jennifer made a great point in the chat too. Supplier diversity program oh. needs to have clean, accurate data. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And actually so, just getting information on diverse suppliers. I mean, it's fabulous in the U.S. because you can register and certify outside of the U.S. It's an absolute nightmare. There's no official body. It's very hard to get that information. Oh, uh, yeah. I imagine it would. But that leads into like the, the discussion that I wanted to have around supplier visibility, right? Um, once we go through this process of normalizing our suppliers and to your point saying, I know exactly how much I spent with Infosys, what's next from your kind of multi-step process, right? After we do the supplier normalization, what do we do next? Next, you need to look at your data and look at how much detail you have in your invoice description. So in your emphasis uh, or your IBM supplier, does it say laptop, software, mouse, keyboard, consulting, software, software maintenance, or does it just say hardware? So depending on what kind of level of, of detail you have in your data, 
is how you would then classify it next. And there are some, if you're at the very start of your classification journey, you don't need anything more than a two or three level taxonomy. You just want the basics so that you can start to interrogate your data and know how much you're spending on professional services, facilities, um, HR, all those kinds of things. If you are further along that journey, you might then want to start to interrogate your IT. So we want to know exactly how many mice or mouse we, mouse, mice. I don't know how, is mice, computer mice, it's is that? It's mice, I think it's mice. Mice, <laughs> mice. 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 Um, how many keyboards, like how many laptops or how many Dell laptops, how many IBM laptops, you know, you, you you might want to go to that level of detail or, you know, if you're in manufacturing, then it's really important to know what type of nuts, bolts and screws you're buying because they go into different machines, different parts, etc. However, if you are uh, me as a business, I just need to know that I bought some hardware. I don't even need to know that it's a nut, a bolt or a screw. I just need to know it's hardware. So it has to be the right kind of classification for the type of quality of data you have and also the, the needs of your business and your objectives. If you, I would say though, that if you do think that one day you will need detailed classification in the future, start with a detailed taxonomy, have it there. You might not need it right now, but you might wanna look back to in two years time and say, okay, this is how many we bought. So always think about like the future as well and how you might need it, not just for right now, but for further down the line. You keep using the word taxonomy. Can we just verify, and I said it right. Can you we did say it right. That we've all got a common definition. Not that, you know, I don't know what it means because I'm just a dumb procurement guy, but just in case, <laughs> what's a taxonomy? You know, I always thought that I was the least smart person in the procurement room. And I was exhibiting at an event about four years ago. And I was talking to a procurement professional about taxonomies and she had no idea because she called them a category tree, something completely different. Uh, basically, the taxonomy is a table and it can be one to five or six levels long um, that you use to classify your data. So your level ones will typically be IT, HR, facilities, marketing, uh, it could be MRO if you're in manufacturing, and then your level twos would go into a bit more detail, so hardware, and then level three would be laptops or monitors or peripherals and mice, keyboards, cables, etc. And it goes for the, the longer it is, the more detail it has, and and that's like your your table that you use to classify all your data. And for me, it should be a couple of things. So I'm sure, can you see the UNSPSC? UNSPSC yeah. or SIC? <laughs> so the UNSPSC is a terrible example of a taxonomy. It's not chart or analytics friendly. It's way too wordy and technical for most people. It's very hard to find what you're looking for because the categories are not particularly procurement friendly either. Um, so that's a really good example of a bad taxonomy. Um, uh, an example of a good taxonomy would be facilities level one, and then you might have cleaning level two, and then you could split your cleaning out into products and services. And then you could even go into detail after that, like window cleaning or uh, outside cleaning and, you know, all those washroom services or different types of cleaning products, cloths, bleach, buckets, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that would be a good, and you'd keep it short, the word short. So let's not use the word information technology. Let's just use the word IT. Let's keep it short and sharp. We don't have to explain everything in detail in the first couple of levels. So it's enough to say hardware. We don't have to say hardware and peripherals and accessories. Let's just say hardware, because we all know it's going to fall under that. And that's my definition of a taxonomy. Okay. So I'd be interested to know if anyone else calls it something other than a taxonomy or a category tree. Anybody? We can just make something up, just a material, material group. group. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Kim.
category I classification. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. We do have cat goes MG category tree. Yeah. Excellent. So, so even know. that isn't, you know, we're not all talking the same language, even, even on that part. Yeah. So we have normalized our supplier data. Now we've got this great visibility into it. And we've categorized it either into material groups or category trees or this taxonomy that we've created. Or if worse comes to worse, we're using the UNSPC taxonomy. And we're all less than happy about it. But I mean, those that's what's in most of our ERP systems, they use the UNSPC. Oh, Right? Which I is great if you're in manufacturing, you know, hardware is really well covered and so is lab supplies. Go to marketing and you've not got a chance. Yeah, that's true. Products, I mean, services or, or like MSPs, that kind of stuff is not really well represented in the USP code, UNSPC thingy, taxonomy. Um, so we've got that. What's the next step according to your plan that's someone else's problem now I'm, I'm just kidding <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm just kidding um so you might have heard me talk about make sure your data has its coat on mm -hmm. so I say that your your data should be consistent so we're all using the same units of measure date formats terms to call things what they are like a taxonomy or a material group um, it needs to be organized, so have it categorized, um, and also not just by like IT, etc., but categorized by region, by country, by division, however you need your business needs to report on information. And then, of course, it has to be accurate or as accurate as you can get it. And then when you have all those three things, the consistency, the organization, and the accuracy, you can have trustworthy data. And then you know that when you're making a decision, it's based on the right information that you, your suppliers can't get one up on you because they know that your data is bad and, and they can take advantage because you know your data is good now and they can't take advantage anymore. Um, and you'll have that in the beginning and it'll be wonderful. But guess what? That coat won't stay on for very long if you don't maintain. So it's really important to regularly do refreshes and depending on the volume of data you might want to do that monthly or quarterly that would be my recommendation um, but also you want to go back and spot check that data because just because it's classified correctly at the time doesn't mean in six months it's still going to be classified correctly because people can accidentally delete things they can cut and paste over things they might even have a different opinion about what it should be categorized as and if you've already got your coat and decided those terms and standards then you need to make sure it's still right in six months so regular maintenance and spot checking of your data is so important and I know it sounds like just another thing to add to your list of many things that you have to do but even by spending an hour or maybe a couple of hours a month just doing some checks will save you so much time and heartache and potential financial troubles later on down the line. Okay, so we've got this super clean data that we've just spot checked. And- um, Is that Robbie okay. calling for me? <laughs> yeah, somebody <laughs> calling for you. It's Robbie Williams, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now I've, I've got this data, how, how, how can I use it? Can I, can I, well, have you ever been asked to put together like a demand forecast or something like that for one of your clients? No, the, the most I've done is, is let's look at how many suppliers you have in, in total, uh, true suppliers once it's been normalized. Um, let's have a look at how many suppliers per category you have. Um, quite often, there'll be way more than you should. And then you can start to look at reducing some of those. You might want to look at if you've got this information on and off contract spend and see if there's compliance. You might want to look for fraud in your tail spend. Um, I went to a, a summit 
last month and heard some horrific stories on fraud that goes goes under the radar. And it's, it's not large amounts that go missing. It's small amounts over time that people don't pay any attention to. You know, this one guy, he's, he stole £230,000 over a number of years um, and he never spent the money. It sat in a bank account and he only did it because he could. It wasn't because he needed the money. He wasn't desperate. He kept telling them there was a problem with their system and they didn't do anything about it and even though he didn't spend the money and it was in the bank account he still went to jail um and it, it was just as simple as he was paying money to his bank account as an employee and then set up a business with the same bank account and you can do you can check that in something as simple as a pivot table i mean it's there are so many it's not just about the cost savings it's about the risk um and, and, and also knowing who your suppliers are and where they're based so that you can then plug into further different partners, you know, to get more credit information, uh, legal information, make sure they're complying with like modern slavery, they've not been prosecuted for anything. If you don't have that data right at the start, you're not going to be able to find out that information. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Oh, yeah. there's lots of little nuggets. You should see what goes through on P cards, honestly. Oh, you, yeah, you're speaking my language, honey. I <laughs> I have had fist fights almost with some people at American Express. <laughs> so yeah. Gladys, Gladys Leibowitz. Hi, Gladys. Hi. Um, asked the question in the chat. Are there best practices related to leveraging spend by stakeholder groups within as well as across the taxonomy? Oh, it's a bit of a big question for this time of night. Let's see. Delivering <laughs> spend by stakeholder groups. Oh, I don't even know where to. I think this whole one size fits all approach doesn't work. So even within an organization, depending on who your stakeholder is, you need to take a different approach. They will have different priorities, objectives. You have to find there what's in it for me to to get them to, uh, to pay attention. Um, the one thing I would say is if you are building a new taxonomy, and I do build a lot of customized taxonomy, don't, don't get everybody involved because I have a client right now who decided to put it out to the business for review before they came back to me. And, you know, six months later, I'm still waiting on it because they can't agree on anything. There's, there's a point where you just have to make a decision and say, that's it, you are going with this. But if you're trying to get more resources, more funding for things, target their what's in it for me. Like, I need to increase my profit this year. Okay, I can help you do that as procurement, but we need better data to do it. Invest this tiny bit of money and we'll, we'll create all this for you. Um, or, you know... We're spending a week, a month, trying to put reports together for the monthly board meeting. Like if we had better data and a better tool, we could do this in a day or less. And it would take one person to do it, not five. So, you know, driving profitability again. Um, thanks, Chester. Uh, yeah, there it's, you have to know, know your audience. Like they say, when you're talking to, when you're presenting. You know, if I came here and started talking about Robbie Williams to you all, then, you know, there would not still be all these people on this call because they wouldn't be interested in what I have to tell you about Robbie Williams and see my slideshow. You know, that's not what I'm here for. So no, no but, you know, he, he hangs around in the background to keep me company. Um, yeah, know who you're talking to and what their motivations are. That helps a lot. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question, Gladys. And I love that name. That's a good old solid, old fashioned name. Love it. <laughs> okay. I've normalized my supplier information. I've classified everything. My taxonomy is ready to go. It's all set up. My boss comes to me and says, mm, inflation is crazy right now, David. What can we do to contain costs? How do I start tackling that? 
with this I'd look brand at new spanking idea of beautifully clean, pristine, Mr. Clean data that you've given me. Wow, you see, now you've got this data, you can you can look across the board, across suppliers at what you're paying for, for the same item across multiple suppliers. So you can start to wean out the suppliers that are way higher than, than the others, or you can renegotiate and say, look, we're paying X amount with this and focus on the, and, and also with this data, you'll be able to look at like the, the highest frequent say in terms of purchasing items if it's or services or whatever it is start with those what can you get of those because you're buying them the most that's probably where you can make the most savings um and then work down your list until you, you get to to a point where it's actually the time to figure out how much you could save is less than is is, is worth more than what you could save Do we have any other questions from the uh, audience here, or can I keep um, um, Susan talking? Because I like the sound of her voice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't the TCO level cost reconstruction depend on how POs are structured to show itemization of charges? That is a whole other session. Um, <laughs> we need to get better. Uh, and, and I say this as a supplier because I classified myself in one of my clients' files and my invoice description was shocking. It was awful. It, it meant nothing. And, and that was a huge learning for me, um, realizing that I need to put in my invoice description to my client exactly what I did, classified data. Like not as per service agreement, da 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 but actually I classified some data and I normalized some suppliers. And, and we need to work with the suppliers to get better information in the invoice or PO descriptions. Uh, it starts normally with a PO so, and then transfers to an invoice. So let's, let's work with them. But there's a whole education piece around that as well. Absolutely, 100% agree to and, that. And what, even, even from the supplier's point of view, there's a benefit to listing exactly what you've provided because if there's a query on an invoice and all it says is services, prove, prove what services you, you've charged mm -hmm. for. Prove that you did or didn't do this thing. You know, it doesn't yeah. say in the invoice. Um, it, so it can help both parties. That's been, a, that's been a huge challenge across multiple organizations that I've worked with where you've, you're, you're asked to review an invoice and it says services rendered. And then you have to go back to a PO that just says services for SOW number 422, which uh -huh. is then not attached to the purchase order. So then you have to go back to another system to find the SOW. And can I, can you tell them a little frustrated about that? Maybe, <laughs> but it's, it's common. You know? I think I think there's a whole new marketing campaign on this coming. It's it's uh <laughs> it's it, it's for everybody's benefit. Yeah, and I think I think a part of it is absolutely, and this is a little bit off topic, and I'm sorry to everyone, but when you're building out your P2P system, it's important to have someone from your procurement team involved in those discussions. So this way, you don't get the one that looks like Amazon but works like crap. You know. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion, and I went off topic. <laughs> Preaching Four. to the choir. Yeah, I got you. Absolutely. Um, data is normalized. We've addressed our. <laughs> Gladys agrees with me. Um, we've addressed our our uh, taxonomy. We've clarified everything. What did we miss? From your opinion, what is this? What is that that last thing that we need to do just to make sure everything is buttoned up tight and nice? Uh, my my phrase within my own team is check, check, and check again. So the team will classify parts of a file individually because normally there could be millions of rows of data. So it's split between the team. They all take a part of the alphabet and do their bit. Comes back together. Actually, before that, it gets normalized. It then gets checked again. Then it goes to classification stage. Then gets classified, and any other further normalization amendments are made at that stage. 
everything comes back together. It's then checked again. And then before it goes out the door, I then check it. So it's that kind of triple check that is my, my go-to. And just keeping that maintenance, keeping that coat on, doing it regularly. Um, but you have to have your whole team on the same page. And trust me, like I know I have six people on my team now. Getting consistency and agreement and standards, you know, that are all the same is hard. It takes time and it takes hard work. It takes a lot of training, but but it benefits everybody in the end because it means I'm not going back to them at the end of each session going this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong you should do you should know this I, I don't feel like a bad person or, or completely OCD because it's not quite right and then they don't feel bad because you know they've probably got like 95 percent of the file right but because I've been doing this for so long I can nail in on that last five percent um and it makes it easier because the more you start to look at your data the more you suddenly know when things don't look quite right and it, whether that's a supplier and the, the description of what they've invoiced you for or whether it's the amount, because you know that every month it's the same amount and then suddenly one month it's huge. What's going on here? Yeah. So it makes it easier and then it just smooth, speeds everything up. But it's, it's never just have that one person in your team who's an expert, unless you are the one person in the team, then, then you have to be but spread the knowledge so that even if somebody's off sick leaves, you still have consistency within your team that everything can keep going and you can get someone new in and train them up or whatever, but it takes time. You know, it's when I take on new people, it takes a good six to 12 months to get them up to speed because in my side of things, we're dealing with different industries every time we classify a file. It's never, it's not consistently the same data. So, you know, and if you've got people within your organization looking at it day in, day out, it might be three to six months that you can have them up and running. Okay. Given but we only have a few minutes it. left. Oh. I know it's terrible. What? Okay. So here's what I'd like to do. We've got, we had that little poll at the beginning. Right. Yeah. And it seems like there's a lot of people who don't trust their data. How would they, if they so desired, engage with you, the classification guru? And, um, you know, what would it look like typically for an engagement with with you and your team? It starts with a simple chat. Let's find out what your problem is and, and can I actually help? That's a really good start. And, and there are many times or times that I have said, you know, this is not something I can help you with. The next step would be, uh, I normally like to get a sample of the potential client's data and do a bit of sample normalization and classification to show them what it could look like, because quite often they need to justify that cost within the business. At that point, I mean, the main factors are things that I need to know is how many suppliers, how many rows of data, what does the quality of that data look like in terms of the invoice description? And then I can do a formal proposal from that. And, you know, some people are quite happy with the price on an email and, and other people need a full on PDF 10 page document. So <laughs> whatever someone needs, I can work with. Um, and, and it's very much um, I see myself as part of their team. So. I, we can have regular meetings and catch ups once a week, once a fortnight. I have often joined into to team meetings to, to get more involved because the more involved, the more I can help. And it's a communicative process. So there's always updates. It's very collaborative. At the end of the day, um, I, I wouldn't take on a job that I didn't think you needed me for. Uh, and I'm very honest about that. Um, you know, there's, I've had, I've had, I did say to a client and I did actually get them in the end, but I said, if, if you want to just use your DL codes to classify, you don't need me. I shouldn't be here having this conversation. Um, and, and I rant about the GL codes in the book as well. <laughs> and then, and then they get uh, the file back in one file. Uh, we always classify 100% of the file. So I don't care if you have, 10,000 rows at one cent, we will still classify them so that you've got a whole file. 
that you then get six weeks to review and then we'll make any changes. And, you know, I've never had anybody come back and, and say, this isn't right or um, because it's been horribly classified wrong. There are always instances where there's classification that is specific to a business. So, you know, in, in my world, onto the outside world, it would look like, say, IT software. But in a market research company, it's actually part of their data spend. So, and, and that is so specific to market research companies that there's no way you could know that unless you had, you know, been doing that kind of thing. So, and we work with the clients to, to get it to that stage where it's right. And then we can even help build master lists for you if you want to maintain it yourself going forward or other clients we do quarterly or monthly refreshes to just keep it keep it going and you please 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 put your contact information in the chat so this way if anyone wants to engage uh with you either on linkedin or directly via email or whatever it is um please take advantage of it um if, if, you know, Kathy and I can uh, be of assistance in any way, shape or form um, in, in ensuring that you get the best possible service from Susan and her team, let me know. Well, I, thank you. Um, and also, I, I know um, that I am not the, the stereotypical corporate consultancy. So, what you see right now is what you get when you work with me and I have a no bullshit approach and and I'll be very open and honest I won't swear at you all the time I promise but um I I don't try and charge for things that are unnecessary um you know you you pay for the time that it takes us to do this um we are happy to even do training for your team and things like that you know, if you even just wanted me to come in and do a talk, I'm happy to do that for free, like a webinar type, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes on the dangers of dirty data or something, you know, because for me, yes, obviously I want to pay my bills and pay my team, but spreading the word about the importance of data is is just as important for me. Thank you so much, Susan, for your time today. Thank you. Go out and grab her book. Uh, between the, the sheets, the spreadsheets, between the spreadsheets. Sorry, I was thinking about the Isley brothers uh, <laughs> between the spreadsheets. Um, and everybody, I hope you guys have a great day. Susan, thank you so much. Kathy, thank you for thank you facilitating. So um, appreciate you guys so much. Thanks everyone for coming along. You're the best, Susan. Thank you so much. You're the best. <laughs>